Hare Krishna, Rajvi Hari Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Welcome Prabhuji. to the Monks Podcast. Thank you very Thank much you. for sparing your time and joining. My pleasure. You know, the, for many years when I was in Iskand Pune, I used to be looking after the, um, after the media, public, public relations. And so I used to search what news about Iskand comes. So in the newspapers and the public media, so one of the most uh, surprising and positive uh, coverages of ISKCON was about how you had pioneered the mediation department. And I think uh, it was in India Today or one of the prominent, mag quite respectable magazines. And it said that uh, ISKCON was, I think, the first among Hindu religious organizations to, or Indian religious organizations to do that. And it was quite a, quite a positive coverage. So at that time, I was quite new. I think it must have been a 2003 or 2005 or something like that. Do you yeah, remember? 2002 or three. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, two or three. So at that time, I had no idea of the... I was wondering, why do we need this? <laughs> <laughs> but over the years, uh, as I have... I think the first time we met and talked in detail was in Vrindavan. Mm. Mm. And you were so warm. So I called you, Prabhu. I said, I want to talk with you. And then we met and you bought some coconut water for me. And then probably the, you were talking with me as if, you know, probably I had some problems and you were making me comfortable to share the problems. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to know about your service and what inspired you to do that. So I remember one thing you said at that time that, you know, because there is so much distress that happens when there is conflict among devotees. And if we can help in removing that distress, then it's a great Vaishnava Seva that we can do. So that dramatically shifted my vision of conflict resolution. I used to think of conflicts as something which is unnecessary there and we just have to deal with them as a part of the material world. While that is true, but that vision, the positive vision was wonderful. So since then, of course, many times I have interacted and I've seen how you have a very broad, inclusive perspective on things. You understand both sides of a debate quite well both sides so i that's why i thought you know you would be the best person for our topic today of you know, how to disagree without becoming disagreeable yes, great so, title so so maybe can you start with how you how the mediation service came to you and how we what happened because of which we got such a positive coverage how did you pioneer mediation well, and, and, it's, and it's broader than mediation. It's a whole field of conflict resolution. Mediation is one part of it, um, okay. where two people come together with a neutral third person. Sometimes it's facilitating meetings, uh, and uh, it could be 20, could be five people, 12 people, 20 people, 300 people, and, and devotees in this case, and helping them work through issues and, and, and concerns or, or, or planning the future, you know, it could be so many different things. And it's, sometimes it's also an ombudsman who um, is a person you can talk to totally confidentially and know that no one, that they won't repeat it to anyone. And they help you think about your options of how to deal with whatever challenges you're having in your life or challenges with the organization or challenges with another devotee or uh, whether. So it's very broad, actually. Uh, I got inspired by this because I started around 1995 I started attending, well, the GBC meetings and also other meetings around ISKCON. I was living in India at that time, but also visiting other parts. And I saw uh, other parts of ISKCON. And I saw how leaders had to spend so much time on internal disputes, internal conflicts. And it was taking away from their, their focus on planning for the mission. And, and also not only that, but, you know, conflicts take away so much of our energy and they, they drain us. So I didn't know anything about conflict resolution at the time. So I just asked the GBC for a $500 grant just to buy books, <laughs> buy books about conflict resolution. So one devotee, uh, uh, he, he uh, Madhava Pandit Prabhu was his name, is his name. Uh, he heard about this. And he said, you know, I have a next door neighbor. My parents are very well-to-do and they live in Martha's Vineyard, which is a, a very 
well, uh, expensive, well-to-do. Uh, it's an island off of Boston. You have to take a, a boat to get there. And my parents' next door neighbor is this famous, uh, his name is Arnold Zach, is this famous conflict resolution person. So he introduced me to him and he became like my mentor. He was a professor at Harvard and also the uh, president of the American Arbitration Association and a very friendly um, elderly gentleman. And he kind of took me under his wing and got very interested in trying to help the Hare Krishna movement with this. And then he introduced me to the ombuds, ombudsman at uh, MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Mary Rowe. Mm -hmm. And she's also been kind of my guide and uh, we've known each other now for 18 years and we probably shared six or 7,000 emails over that time. Just, you know, um, and she's very respectful to devotees. And when she gives presentations, she often talks about the Gita and the Gita values, something that we've talked to her about. Um, so, so gradually they just through uh, their guidance and, and my, you know, uh, I, then I went back to college and got a degree, a master's degree in conflict resolution. Oh. Uh, we've slowly built up something called ISKCON Resolve. And I got uh, Brahmatirta Prabhu involved. He's the co-director of ISKCON Resolve. He's the famous Bob Cohen in Perfect Questions, yeah. Perfect Answers, Prabhupada's books. And then some other senior devotees have helped a lot over the years, uh, especially Yogeshwar Prabhu, who uh, Prabhupada sent him to France to start the movement in France. Yeah. So he's a very, very senior devotee. And uh, Braj, um, uh, Braja Lila Mataji in America, and many, many, many devotees. Uh, now we actually have eight ombuds in, in uh, India that we're about to start training and develop a program there. Oh. And we have very good programs in the Ukraine, in Russia, in the UK, in South Africa, and in the US. So it's, it's been very fulfilling to see uh, that now many devotees and many leaders come to us and they, they, uh, they feel that it's a, it's a service to, uh, we feel it's a service to them that they can kind of uh, sometimes not worry about certain things and we can try to help come up with some kind of win-win uh, solution oh. to whatever the problem is. So just a little tracking back, how come there's these mediators in your, they were so friendly with the Hare Krishnas? Was it they are naturally friendly people or they had some appreciation for Hare Krishna or it's because of your learning attitude or what? Uh, well, um, <laughs> Arnold's only experience with the Hare Krishnas was trying to get sold books in airports. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he didn't have a very positive attitude, okay. but he was intrigued. He was intrigued. Okay. And when he met, he met me and he met Shesha Prabhu. Well, that's the other person we've been working very closely with. And Shesha Prabhu is such a high class, cultured person. Um, I don't know about myself, but he just uh, developed a, quite a good friendship with us. And then uh, for Mary, she, she met, uh, spent a lot of time with Shonaka Rishi Prabhu in Oxford and Shesha Prabhu and Brahmatirtha Prabhu. And uh, she spent some time with Pragosh Prabhu in, 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 well, he was in the UK at the time. And she, she developed quite a liking for, for devotees, but also in her case, a real appreciation for the Bhagavad Gita. Oh, okay. I like that. So, and, and also... What did you like about the Bhagavad Gita? I mean, well, we, you know, the... Uh, the, uh, the Gita Valley. Devotees in Oxford and myself and Shesha Prabhu and Brahmatir Prabhu, we came up with these, uh, what we call Gita values. Yeah. And um, I, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to remember all six right now, but Samadarshina, uh, Priti, or Affection, right? Uh, 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 um, Icha, or choice, desire, cho but we call it choice. Uh, acharya, or teaching by, you know, example. Yeah. Uh, Amanitvam, humility. And I forgot the sixth one right now. But, but you know, there's so, there's such important principles in the Gita. And, they're, and they're, any religion, practically, any person from any spiritual background can appreciate those, those values. And they are very core to uh, to the Gita, and then of course surrounding all of them is is Sharanagati or Bhakti or surrender to Krishna. 
And so she, I've seen her actually, you know, go to like professors at MIT and start talking about the Gita values and using the Sanskrit words also. So this Gita values is a very contemporary way of presenting the Gita's wisdom. Yeah, yeah, we found, uh, we found it to be uh, very helpful. And that, now what we're trying to do is uh, write like a, a paper on each one of them. Oh, okay. Yeah, so develop them more. Yeah. So then you mentioned that there is a significant presence across the world of the uh, ISKCON Resolve. So what exactly does uh, ISKCON Resolve do? That means any devotee can approach the ISKCON Resolve for any conflict that they have? Yes, any devotee can approach uh, uh, one of the uh, ISKCON Resolve ombudsmen and uh, know that it's going to be a confidential conversation that they, no one would repeat it. I wouldn't repeat it to anyone or any of the other ombudsmen without their permission. And that it's, yeah, it's an off the record discussion and that our role is to be neutral, not like to be their advocate, but to try to help whatever it is the situation, help them resolve it. And so, so we've, we've, we've had, um, devotees, you know, talk to us about conflicts. We've also, we've also had devotees talk about their struggles in their personal lives and feeling that, okay, well, here's one person I can trust because I know it's confidential and I can actually, you know, reveal my heart to them and, and the struggles that I'm having with this or that and know that it won't end up on Facebook the next day or, you know, or in, a, in an article somewhere. And, and we can even, we're not, mental health professionals, but sometimes just listening to someone and talking to them, we can either that sometimes that's enough to help the person or we can give them resources, you know, here, talk to this devotee or talk to, you know, consider this kind of program, things like that to help them get their needs met. Oh, that's a very important. So, it's, so it is a spectrum, but yes, most people are coming to us with, with conflicts and, and there's all kinds. There's, there's, there's conflicts with, uh, you know, in brahmachari ashrams with, you know, the person in the next uh, bunk or something like that, or, or on traveling sankirtan in the same band. Sometimes that can be very intense. And of course, naturally in any organization, it's not that ISKCON is different. Any organization, there's always going to be challenges with, uh, with kind of the rank and file and leadership because it's just, it's just the nature of, of, of the yuga. Oh. Now, we, we have a joke that uh, uh, conflict resolution in Kali Yuga is a growth industry. Growth <laughs> industry, okay. Yeah, it's not going to go away. <laughs> you, you can, can't, make, you're sure you'll be employed. You know, so, so a lot of it is also, you know, devotees, sometimes we just, or people in general, we don't, they don't know how to deal with a conflict. And so a, a coming with a neutral third person who has some skills they just feel such a relief that, okay, I can, you know, now I have some faith that we can actually not just, you know, keep going like uh, on for 10 years, we can actually settle this. And then really, and then the, I, the services to the mission is then we can much more focus on our service and, and fulfilling Prabhupada's mission. It, it's so much energy gets wasted. In, yes, of course, uh, this is, yeah. as I travel across the world, I see so many people coming up with uh, issues with sometimes the management, with other devotees or whatever. So, Prue, do you get, do you have some filtering process of whom you take up? Because otherwise you could become completely overwhelmed. <laughs> well, uh, so far it's been okay because we have representatives in so many different places. But, it, but you do bring up an interesting point that for the ombudsman or for, or for a preacher like you or, or a monk like you or a, or a leader in any organization what to speak of ISKCON, there is something that we have to be concerned of. Usually it's called um, uh, compassion fatigue. Yes. And, and just the idea of always giving out to others and helping others and helping them and hearing their problems and this problem, that problem, that can have a deleterious or a draining effect hmm. on us. <clears throat> yes, definitely. And so, so we have to be careful about that. And, and we have to be good with our sadhana and our taking shelter of Krishna and his holy name and Prabhupada's books. And also have uh, other people who are confidential 
other ombudsman or other, you know, who we can, who we can talk about cases sometimes, because that's still confidential as long as you're talking to someone who also has the same promise. Or just be a friend and joke with and take prasadam with and just kind of, you know, uh, like in a, a pressure cooker, right? The, the most important part of the pressure cooker is that little thing on top, right? That yeah. pss, lets out the steam. So, so we need that sometimes maybe to go to the Holy Dom, you know, take, take shelter of Panchanga Bhakti. And one of those is, of course, uh, a devotee association. Yeah. So on, so on an, I don't see ISKCON Resolve known that widely or, I mean, so many places I hear about conflicts, but not many devotees tell me that, okay, I went to ISKCON Resolve and I had the conflict resolved. Is it that it's not known so well or devotees feel hesitant to go outside their temple community to seek help or? That and probably some other reasons. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, right now I have a, a still a full-time job. Uh, though I am thinking of retiring in the not too distant future, and then I could work more on establishing it. But these things do take, uh, you know, I, I, I adhere to slow and steady wins the race. Okay. That I really like to, and I'm trying to get younger devotees involved so that there's a succession plan and that this is something that continues, you know, into the future of ISKCON and gradually, you know, slowly, slowly. I, I thought it was very significant that the, uh, <laughs> that the Indian Bureau and the IIAC have chosen to have an ombuds program. It's one of our biggest yatras, the Indian yatra. And so, you know, dire, dire. It's okay with me if it's slow, but the quality is good. Yes. So I, I, it would be, it is important to, uh, uh, to um, have more outreach about it to the devotee community. We're talking about making some videos uh, yeah. and making people aware. I, I just had met to a meeting of uh, Tamil presidents in Europe and said, hey, this is a service for you to lighten your load and to help. Although we're neutral, we don't take the side of management over the individual. We're neutral. But still, um, so a lot of our uh, referrals come from leaders. Oh, okay. And we also work on some very high-profile cases, you could say. In his yeah, of yeah, and so and the other thing is, we don't. Uh, and this is an American saying: we don't toot our horn. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, okay. we, we don't go around and say, "Yeah, we solved this." No, the, the there is a saying that you can be a good mediator, or you can take credit for being a good mediator, but you can't do both. Wow. So really, we give all credit to the parties when they work out a a situation. And we just really, a lot of our advertising is depending on word of mouth and people having a good experience uh, okay. with us. Yes, fine. So, in principle, any devotee who has some relational issues can actually approach the ombudsman of that area. Or, or another ombudsman if they feel more comfortable. Oh, okay. Sometimes they may feel more comfortable uh, and this is something we're working on is the website that would have uh, every, the list all over the world. Because, you know, nowadays it's not like you're in India, I'm in Washington, D.C. We're talking. So they could contact a ombuds person or ombudsman in South Africa or in the U.K. if they would feel more comfortable. Um, I, I believe, for example, I think at this point, the, all the ombudsmen who have been chosen in India are men. But sometimes a woman might not, let's say a woman's being uh, harassed, she might not feel so comfortable talking to a, a man about that. So if she could talk to one of our women ombudsmen, um, you know, that, that's another possibility. Or a young person might prefer talking to a younger person or a senior devotee probably would feel more comfortable talking to Brahmatirta Prabhu or myself or, yeah, okay. you know, like that. So, uh, we try to just, what we want to do, all, what, I mean, is to break down any, try to come up with as few or zero barriers to trying to work things out in our society in a Vaishnava way. Okay, so if, uh, so are you talking about only institutional issues? Say, for example, there are grahasthas and there is domestic uh, abuse in the home. Are, do we take up that kind of issues also? 
Well, we'll take up, maybe not, but what we might do is make referrals, right? Yeah. So we might say, uh, I'm not a uh, expert in that, but uh, we do, and we have a list of devotees around the world who are expert in different things. Oh. Let's say it was a child protection issue. Well, here, here's the contact for the, the child protection office, right? Oh. Or, you know, domestic violence. Well, here's a, uh, some good people that we know who are good marriage counselors. Things like that. So we don't try to say we're, you know, experts in everything. Yeah. But do you remember in the old days there were organizations had switchboard operators? Yes. Yes. So sometimes I feel like I'm a switchboard operator. Hold on a second. I can connect you with so and so. Oh. Okay. So this is there seem to be a lot of resources available which many devotees are not aware of. Yeah. Yeah. And we have to work on them. Uh, and then there's also cultural things that. Uh, you know, a marriage counselor for someone in India, they might prefer, you know, they might relate better with uh, a marriage counselor from that culture rather than someone from New York or something like that, you know, sure, or vice versa. They might actually prefer to talk to a Westerner, right? So yeah. we try to uh, uh, take into account those. So presently we have a ISKCON Resolve website or, or it's going to we come We do, up? but it's, it, we do, ISKCONresolve.com or .org. I think com or org both work. Um, but it, it needs, it needs, uh, improvement. Okay. So, but, but there are some things there that are helpful. Like also there's a page that is about self-help. So, you know, just how to deal with, you know, some things about how to, uh, deal with conflicts just by, you know, how to, like there's one really good thing on how to make an effective apology. Okay. For example. Yeah. So, now, as you also say, have interacted with the broader conflict resolution issues in the outer world. So is it that in the devotee community, uh, conflicts are more or less, or it's more or less the same everywhere? Well, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> you asked either or, and I said yes. Um, there are standard causes of conflict. Um, information, right? Either different information or incorrect information, you know? Uh, these days we have these, uh, what sometimes are called like internet ghettos, you know, uh, in America, if you're, if you're a Republican, you go to Fox news. If you're a Democrat, you go to CNN yes. and you only listen to that side of things. That's so we have that also, I won't mention them, but we have certain websites that are more liberal, more conservative, and people who have that mindset, they just hear that side of things. And so they're not really getting a broader picture. So sometimes uh, So information... what was the word you use? Information ghettos. Ghettos or, or slums. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I have heard ghettos. the word echo chambers. Yeah, that's another, sure, that's another way to, yes, to, so, yeah. to say it. Or you could even say, you know, how do you interpret data, right? Like what what's, makes a successful temple the number of books that went out, the uh, the construction, the you know the uh, the purity of the devotion, you know, and and someone could say, well, my, no, my temple is the best temple. Look how many books we distributed. Oh, well, my look how many devotees we made. You know, so okay. even the interpretation of data can cause conflict. Mm. And then there's structures. Structures can cause conflict, and this is something I think leaders really have to look at. I'll give a simple example from years ago, nineteen. 79, I was the Sankirtan leader in Detroit. And the previous year, uh, the, 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 uh, the plan was that whoever, distrib whoever distributed the most books would get to go to India for the festival. Okay? okay? And I noticed how the mood amongst the book distributors was not very nice. When someone did really well, the others were kind of unhappy because they wanted to win. Yeah. Okay. Because that, that was a structure that was set up. So I I so next year when I was a Sangerton leader, I said that we're gonna uh, create a very, very high goal, almost impossible to reach, but a very high goal. And if we reach that as a team, we all get to go to India. And it was high enough to cover all the airfares and you know, it, right. Um, and the absence of book distributors for uh, three weeks or a month in India. And the mood totally changed. Everyone was so happy when someone did well. 
and everyone was encouraging one another. It was a totally different mood, and we did reach that goal. Uh, and it was just because we, we adjusted the structure, the system. So sometimes systems can cause conflict. So that's, okay. that's another cause of conflict. Um, relationships, we know they cause conflict. <laughs> that's, that's like a, a no-brainer. So but the systems, hardest one... By systems, you are not just simply referring to hierarchies. Like there's a temple president and there is a subordinate people. So it's not that system itself which is causing hierarchy, but a particular... particular... Well, there may be systems within that hierarchy. Okay, that makes sense. Like, you know, how are decisions made? Is it, is it, and I'm not saying one way is, one way is better than the other, but what's really important is that leaders um, set expectations clearly this with my department heads and we take a consensus or is it one person, one vote, or is it I'm the temple president, I'll listen to everyone and then I'll make the decision or is it I'll just make the decision whether I listen or not, you know, there's different but there's, there, that's, that's a system, how decisions are made. We're not gonna change Prabhupada's system. We may you know, make some uh, adjustments. Prabhupada said, I gave you the structure, you have to fill it in, right? Um, okay. So just like you know, in India, there wasn't an IIAC in India 50 years ago, but it's a, it's a, it's a great thing to have, you know, so. <clears throat> so does that, does that make sense? So yes, you know. Yeah, okay, makes sense. You know, I was still the Sangerton leader, but I yeah. looked at things and saw, like, you know, the way we do, did that, that was really not creating a nice Vaishnava atmosphere. Hmm. Okay. Right? So, and now, the biggest, the hardest cause of conflict, the hardest one to, to deal with is values. Now, we could say we all have the same values because we read Prabhupada's books. But as William Blake said, uh, we both read the Bible day and night. You read black and I read white. Yes. Right. So we still have our filters from our, our Purva samskars, our impressions from previous lives, uh, the culture we were born in, how we were brought up by our parents, our early training in Krishna consciousness, our Sangha, our association. And that creates a certain uh, chitta vritti or kind of like a worldview. Mm. Uh, and and now you're asking how the difference so those these up till now these are very similar in any organization okay okay I'll repeat them you said I, I um, is structure uh, relationships data or information and uh, structure yeah. and uh, yes. values yes four of them okay yeah However, what, what, what does set us apart, uh, so first I'll do the negative. What sets us apart negatively is, is that we put a lot of our identity into being a devotee. Let's say you work for uh, Infosys. Okay, so you, know, you, do, you, 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 know, you do put some of your identity in working for Infosys, but you, know, you may uh, quit and work for Wipro. Do they still exist in India? You know, yeah. Or another tech company, uh, you know, HP, you know, it's five years from now, you might change. But a lot of us, yeah, and I'm sure, and I, and I know in India is similar. We, 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 our parents were upset with us when we became a brahmachari. We, we changed our friendships. We changed our hairdo. We changed our dress. We changed the way we see the world. We, we changed, we put so much of our identity into being a member of this con. So let's say I do that, and I'm from New York, and you do that, you're from India, and we have very different backgrounds. But we both put this huge investment into being a member of ISKCON. So when we have differences, uh, you know, I prefer pizza, you prefer pakoras, uh, it becomes more intense because of that, uh, that deep um, deposit of... of we care so much for the institution. And it's so much a part of our identity. So when you have a, 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 a view about something in ISKCON that for me, I just can't relate to at all, sometimes my, my, my knee-jerk reaction is to find fault with you, 
and to minimize you. And there can only be one way to be on top and this into, you know, that ISKCON should see this and it should be my way. And that's where things get more intense. So that's the negative. Uh, and there's a few others, uh, differences in faith-based organizations. Sometimes there's this <clears throat> unclear line between like ashramites and congregation and, or, or in, in, in other religions, it's more like a, a volunteer and staff. Okay. And, yeah. And then a third one, I don't know if we find this so much in ISKCON, but in a lot of faith-based organizations, the conflict between, <clears throat> excuse me, seeing, seeing the temple or the church as a place of shanti, a place to find refuge from the material world, and to, or a place like uh, to go out, like at, you're at war and you've got to save the conditioned souls and evangelical and preaching, preaching, preaching. And those two moods sometimes clash. Oh, okay. Okay. Now, the positive thing is that we have the Krishna conscious philosophy. We're chanting Hare Krishna. We're trying to develop sattva guna. Hopefully, we're trying to develop uh, more concern for vada than uh, jalpa and vitanda, uh, Bhagavad Gita, mm -hmm. chapter 10, verse 32, which we, maybe we should talk about more in a few minutes. Yeah. So there is the positive side. And we also have... Um, what they call superordinate goals. In other words, you and I might have disagreements about this and that, but we, we all agree about Kirtan. We all agree about Prabhupada's books. We all like nice prasadam. You know, we all mm -hmm. think Vrindavan and Mayapur and Puri are wonderful places. So we actually have a lot that we agree on. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is that the closer you are, the more intense the conflict. Like look at husband and wife, or even sometimes, in the, I was a brahmacharya for 12 years, you know, sometimes even in the ashram, or even in ISKCON, we, we, will, we sometimes fight more intensely. Our disagreements, let's say, amongst ourselves are, are, are uh, blowing up much bigger than say our disagreements with the, you know, Sri Sampradaya or something. Yeah. Or, you know, Nimbarkas or whatever. Right, <laughs> because because of that closeness, does that does that help? Does that answer your question? That's quite comprehensive. Maybe I would like to clarify a few things within this. Okay. So, so the fifth factor which you said is, can we call it like our emotional investment in our identity or something like yeah, that? Yeah, identity. Yeah, identity. Yes, yes. Just it's our identity itself. So then. So if we want to say there are differences between say liberal, liberal and conservative perspectives within our movement. So would uh -huh. that come in values or would that come in identity? They're, they're, they're the same, same, basically, same thing, okay. you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just making the point that identity becomes more intense. Yes. Because <clears throat> you were asking the question between uh, outside I, organizations and ISKCON. Yeah. And I think our dedication to ISKCON is of a different intensity or a, uh, than working for the government of India or whatever. Um, and, be, and because we put so much of our identity. And, your, and identity and values are so linked. That's true. I understand this. You know, at one time, I had this experience that I spoke something which was uh, perceived as by some people as being uh, as disrespectful to Prabhupada. And I apologized but somehow the vehemence of the attack was so great, I couldn't figure it out. And then later on, once, I think it was Anathama Prabhu explained to me that actually it is not that they are attacking you because they have a particular conception of Prabhupada. Yes. And that conception is the very basis of their spiritual identity and security. Because exactly. Prabhupada is like this, Therefore, I can surrender to him and I'll be delivered. So right. when I say, okay, you know, Prabhupada's statements, we can understand them this way also. So we, it's not just a difference about, say, it's not just a philosophical disagreement or it's not just an intellectual dispute. It's more like you are attacking my very foundational identity or existence. Exactly. 
exactly. And therefore, Prabhupada gave us a huge challenge. He said that every year, leaders should come together in Mayapur and discuss unity in diversity. He said, if we fight over diversity, that's the material platform. He said, please maintain this philosophy of unity and diversity. That will make our movement successful. So that takes some broad-mindedness. I was uh, uh, just reading, if I can find it real quick, I was just reading the fifth canto, chapter 18, verse 9. Famous, famous verse by Prahlad Maharaj. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with that. You know, I can, uh, that begins, uh, Swasyasti Vishwasya, that one. Can you repeat it, fifth canto? Five. 18.9. Okay. It's one of the most famous verses in the Bhagavatam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so. And, and the, the Prahlad Maharaj says, may there be good fortune throughout the universe. May all envious persons be pacified. May all living entities become calm by practicing bhakti yoga for by accepting devotional service. They will think of each other's welfare. Therefore, let us all engage in the service of the Supreme Transcendence, Lord Sri Krishna, and always remain absorbed in thought of him. And then Prabhupada writes in the purport, the material world is full of envious persons, but if one frees himself of envy, he becomes liberal in his social dealings and can think of others' welfare. Anyone who takes up Krishna consciousness engages himself fully in the devotional and engages himself fully in the devotional service of the Lord, cleanses the mind of all envy. Therefore, we should pray to Lord Nishingadev to sit in our hearts. Bahir Nishingho, Ridayer Nishingha, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it does take some real maturity to say, yes, I have this identity. I really relate to this aspect of Prabhupada, but I, I respect that Prabhupada also said this in other situations, and I respect that you see it differently. How can we cooperate with each other? Mm. But the 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 uh, more passionate uh, reaction, and, and understandably so, I'm not criticizing, is just what you, just what Anutama Prabhu told you, that, you know, this just, this just is not my understanding of Krishna consciousness, my understanding of Prabhupada. And the reality is, if, if for those of us who, you know, really read a lot of Prabhupada's, uh, listen to a lot of his lectures, and he said different things at different times. He, he didn't change principles. One time, Buri Prabhu asked Prabhupada, how do you know the difference between a principle and a detail? Right? Because if you change a principle, then, yeah, Krishna Iskand is really in trouble. But if you don't adjust the details sometimes, we're not being relevant to the world. Right? Mm. And Prabhupada's answer was quite interesting. He said, that takes some intelligence. Yeah, <laughs> that takes some intelligence. So, so how do we... Uh, how do we have that maturity to feel comfortable about our, our way of seeing things, but also be willing and open to hear others without getting defensive? It's this, it's this balance of courage and consideration. And it's this mood of cooperation that Prabhupada talked about. Let me remind me to use the word cooperation a minute from now. But, you know, sometimes if, if we're kind of, a little weak, we, we hear somebody else and we just say, okay, yeah, have your way, right? Or if we're just bullheaded, it's my way or the highway. But they're having the balance of feeling comfortable with our convictions, but then also be willing to re-examine them without just quickly giving them up by hearing uh, another Vaishnava's point of view. Mm. And, you know, Prabhupada's <laughs> just, uh, just amazing how he... Um, in the details, he, he just created, he really did create uh, a house in which the whole world can live. Because you have devotees, you said conservative, liberal, or whatever we want to label them. Um, I know a lot of liberals don't like to be called liberals because they say, liberal, are you kidding? When I talk to anyone outside of ISKCON, they think I'm the most conservative person in the world, the four regulated principles, getting up at four in the morning, you know, <laughs> meditating for two hours, you know. Yeah. So they're, they're very relative terms, and I don't think they help the dialogue very much. But Prabhupada, uh, you know, had a way of attracting uh, everyone, you know, and, and uh, you know, I mean, take, take any 
topic. You know, take Barn Ashram. There, there's so many quotes about, you know, 50% and all those things. And then there's also, you know, it's not for Kali Yuga, you know, all the things in the Shastra. And there's this, there's, there's, there's a, uh, details that people can relate to. Now the principles don't change. Right, Panchanga Bhakti and you know Bhagavad Gita, nectar devotion, et cetera, et cetera. So but let me so now I brought to that word cooperation. I once did a you know, minute, tried to do a Veda based search. What's that? Just one minute. If you, I just if you don't mind, I just wanted to ask something about this. Sure. So before we before we move forward to another subject. So when we talk about uh, so what you're saying is liberals and conservatives, um, maybe those terms don't apply, but let's use them because we don't have any other terms for the time being. So what you're saying is that the more we are invested in our identity, then, then the, the other, any alternative concept of conception of Krishna consciousness, say for example, say I am here, and I am a devotee. So I and say devotee, it's like idealized con conception. So I would like to be as much as possible a devotee according to my idealized conception. But if there is some other devotee who doesn't match my conception, then, then to accept that person as a devotee, then I have to start thinking, am I a devotee or is something wrong with me? So right. in that sense, it becomes a threat. Yes. So, so one thing I observed is that in many ways, it's just a matter of experience. You know, that, yes. uh, that means what you said about open-mindedness, actually, sometimes if I say, uh, here, my, here are some of the classes I gave 10 years ago or 15 years ago, uh, I wince at many of the points I would make. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, if I heard the classes I gave when I was a promontory, I'd think, oh my God. <laughs> Back in the 70s, wow, yeah. So, so in a sense, the more we interact with other devotees, we could say that and, and interact not to judge them, but to understand them, to hear from them, the, then that broader understanding can come about. So when you said broad-mindedness is the solution, so I was just, my question was, how, do we, how does that broad-mindedness come about? One way is just by experience and interaction, but are there any other ways? Well, yeah, but there's a certain quality to the interaction. And I know this doesn't, yeah. For example, really seeing the other person, that the other devotee as a devotee, instead of seeing them as they have that position about something. Right, seeing him as a devotee, they 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 go through, they suffer, and they broke their leg, and they did this, and they did that, and they're really trying to improve their japa, and you know, and just seeing them as that as a person, and not just as an issue. And so, as an example of that, um, I would I facilitate the SGGS, the Sangha of GBCs, Gurus, and Sannyasis. So I, you know, and I know that some of them have, are great friends and others either don't know each other or maybe they have some history because, you know, a lot of these devotees have been devotees 40 or 50 years, right? Um, so as the, in the opening icebreaker, I, I thought, how can we create a mood for the next three days that where people see beyond the labeling them as an issue, right? So I put them in small groups and tried to put them in people either they don't know or people they might have had some struggle with. And there was a lot. There was over 100 devotees there. And the question was, the question was spend five or ten, uh, maybe ten minutes telling people how you came to Krishna consciousness. And that created such an auspicious atmosphere. Because this person that you disagreed on and this and that, you know, they tell you about, oh, I was walking down the street and I heard the Hari Nam party and I was just really intrigued and I got a book, but I put it on the shelf. I didn't read it for two years, but then I read it and, you know, Krishna, you know, and you just see that you just, you know, when you tell stories of how you became a devotee, the, the sincerity and, and the way Krishna acted in their lives becomes so real. And it broke down a lot of those barriers of... Oh, so and so, so you know, is such and such. 
it, we really created a uh, an atmosphere. So I think there is that you know kind of like the Mahabharat we hear right they fought during the day and then they took they uh, had meals together at night uh, you know and, and if we can do that if we can say you know Chaitanya Ch Charanpu I totally disagree with you matter of fact I, I I'm I'm not sure you understand this point properly but let's uh, and and after that let's let's have kirtan and I really respect you as a as a devotee I think that is going to make an auspicious uh, future this does not mean, by the way, and I want to make this clear, that there are boundaries. It's not yato matato pat, right? You know, as you, you know, it's not Bhagavad Gita as you like. Yeah. It's Bhagavad Gita. So there are boundaries, right? But we tend to really use the word bogus and rascal and things like that uh, easily. Now, now, I'd like to also say this is a phenomenon we see a lot. Um, I maybe. I'm right about a certain point, and you're wrong about a certain point. But I don't see the part. I don't see where I may be wrong, and I don't see where you may be right. <laughs> so I feel very, very um, strong in my convictions because I know this part is right, and I know that, and I'm quite convinced that this part is wrong. But then sometimes we can get. It's also how we deal with each other. You know, Vaishnavas and having a dialogue instead of a debate. I, I would like to share, can I share my screen for a minute? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I really, I gave, a, this is by the way, a seminar I gave at the ILS on uh, the seven keys to successful ISKCON future. Mm. And I, you know, someone, someone to talk to, we talked about that, right? If you're having some struggles, um, innovation without compromising Christian conscious principles. But this is the one for today, right? Respect dialogue not defeating debate uh, and this was a chart that I showed right so debate is assuming that there is a right answer and that I have it dialogue is assuming that others have pieces of the answer and that together we can craft a solution and one is combative one is collaborative right? one's about winning especially Jalpa and Vitanda and one is about finding common ground the, the idea of uh, uh, Vada Right, you know that, um, so if I could just quote that. So this is from Gopi Pranadana Prabhu's uh, translation of the commentary of Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur on 1032, right? And he says, Nyaya logic teaches various ways to reach a conclusion, including Vitanda, Vada, and Jalpa. Krishna says, I am Vada, the natural conclusion. Yeah. Vada is debate carried out fairly according to standard rules without trying to force the establishment of a particular conclusion. Vitanda is quibbling or merely destructive argument in which one tries to defeat the opponent by any means possible but does, not subs uh, but does nothing substantial to positively prove one's own thesis. Jalpa re uh, uses various deceptive means to fool the opposition is unfair argument. Vitanda and Jalpa are forms of argument in which winning, not necessarily determining the truth, is the main consideration. Mm. So we want we want Vada, right? We want the truth, and and so um, you know this difference here between debate and dialogue is a uh, important one, and learning to listen. Uh, is such a powerful way for Vaishnavas to come together. Okay, I have a strong conviction, but Chaitanya Trampu, I really want to hear how you see things. And it's not that I just give in. I say, well, I, okay, I accept that, but I still disagree with this. You know, we can have a respectful dialogue without being either wishy-washy or, or bullheaded. <laughs> mm. right? Those are two extremes that we, we don't necessarily want. And, yes. and you know, we, we do know that Prabhupada sometimes is very strong in his preaching and, and, uh, and, and very bold. There are other times, that he wrote, one of my favorite letters that Prabhupada wrote was to Balavanta Prabhu. Can I show that on the screen? Yes, please. Is that, is that right? Uh, I have a whole list of Prabhupada quotes here, but this is one, uh, if I can find it. Now I want that we shall recruit 
So he's talking about preaching to intelligent people, right? He was, now I want, this was college preaching in America in 1972. Now I want that we shall recruit more and more our men amongst the intelligent class of men. They, because they are a little educated or they have some wealth or fame or ability, so they will sometimes be a little puffed up, but that's all right. <laughs> they deserve it. Isn't that cool? Wow. Everybody says that. Now we shall have to learn the art, how to approach such higher class men and attract them to apply themselves to this Krishna conscious process of self-realization. That requires much tact. And we shall have to expect to meet all challenges by sharp minds. But if we remain always absorbed in remembering Lord Chaitanya, how he converted so many intelligent men, even sitting for three days or maybe seven days in, uh, with Sarvabhoma, uh, days and nights to hear them speak without himself speaking anything. And if we remember how Krishna was so much patient to explain everything to Arjuna, even Arjuna was speaking like a fool. So in this way, being always tolerant of others and appreciating their point of view. So do you hear that? Being tolerant of others and appreciating their point of view. It'll be easy matter for us to convince them gradually to join us. And that's an amazing point because um, I, uh, I was alive and kicking in 1972 and a college student in America, their point of view was four things, drugs, sex, rock and roll, and Mayavad philosophy. The prophet said, so if you listen to them and appreciate their point of view, then you, you know, or, or as uh, Covey said, Stephen Covey said, seek first to understand then be understood. Yes. So sometimes the most powerful thing we can do is ask the right questions and be a good listener. And, so powerful, and, Prabhu, and this is so powerful in a sense that Prabhupada is asking us to appreciate the points of view of people who are not even devotees. And how so much more speak of devotees. Yes. And I found your point earlier made, you earlier made was very striking that when uh, we are hearing, we need to first see them as devotees and then identify them as whatever based on their particular position as right. liberals or conservatives. Sometimes th that position becomes their defining identity in, in our eyes. That's right. And then it, that's uh, sad. That's sad. Because uh, yeah. I mean, even, even our philosophy, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, we're talking about our identity. We should gradually be trying to give up if we are conservative or liberal, more focus on Nitya Krishna Das. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Those things, you know, how much longer are we a conservative or liberal? I'm 62 years old. Let's say, uh, you know, one astrologer once told me I'll live till 80. I could, I could die tomorrow. So, so 18 more years, I'm a conservative or liberal. And then what? <laughs> you know, Krishna has such an interesting sense of humor. He might make me the opposite in my next life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Right? If I'm meditating on, you know, oh, I really don't like those liberals. I really don't like those liberals. <laughs> next life, I may be. <laughs> yum, yum, vapi, smaram, bhavam. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> that, this... Earlier, you mentioned about this point of investment of identity, and it's not just an emotional investment, it's also intellectual investment. So, sometimes, in the sense that, because as compared to many other organizations, we do give a lot of emphasis on philosophy. Yeah. So, one more thing that happens, I felt, is that sometimes we reduce people to philosophical categories. Yeah. You know, this is a Mayavadi, this is a worshipper of the Devtas, this person is a, like this. Now, people are complex. Their identities are multidimensional. And with, with respect to specifically, say, people who follow impersonalism. So, Advaita Vadis, you know, maybe that is just one part of their identity. And in culture, they might be very kind and uh, very considerate. In their business, they might be honest and upstanding. In their family, they might be responsible. And we just look at that one part and condemn them as for whatever their philosophical orientation is. So it is... Right, and then if you think... I'm sorry, did they cut you off? Yeah, yeah. Then it actually backfires very badly. In fact, I think Krishna in the 18th chapter talks about knowledge in the mode of ignorance. And that's 1822. It's a very beautiful verse. He says, when you take one part of something to be everything. Yattu krutsna vadekasmin kare sakta mahetukam. So 
ironically our philosophy instead of say broadening our vision because of our philosophy we might take one part of the other person's identity and we might reduce the whole person to that part oh right. you have this view on this philosophy you have this view philosophically that's unacceptable and therefore you are unacceptable so somebody might argue with you that uh we can't water things down and we have to be strong so i do think uh you know what is it uh, we should be uh strict with ourselves and liberal with others so for example in your example we should be very very clear about mayavad and and vaishnava siddhanta and be fixed in that and that strength that we have then we can be much more liberal and i mean look at how lord chaitanya how he dealt with prakashan and desai he he engaged him in service right he you know he allowed he he chose to sit in that dirty place so that he could give some agata sukriti so we might engage a uh, you know who knows what some of our donors what their philosophy of life is right but they're giving some of their intelligence some of their money some of their you know words or whatever to uh, to lord chaitanya's service and and that purifies them you know yes. um and we we and then sometimes you know we get a chance when when we've developed some friendship hey we, you know we might talk to them a little bit about their philosophy and and gradually through uh our friendship and our relationship uh try to bring them around to to a, a more vaishnava understanding yes but i think we can be when we're comfortable in our own shoes when we're strong in our krishna consciousness we can be more liberal with others that's that's it's amazing perspective i'll come to that just one point before this now i've been uh, giriraj maharaj has written a book on the juhu project so it's almost completed and it's going to soon publish it so he had sent it to me for looking at it and it is wonderful so many things over there see almost all the major life patterns that we had uh, the supporters they were already followers of other spiritual teachers and committed followers they had their pictures in their temple in their homes they had some in, the, in their altars and prabhupada would visit their houses so giriraj maharaj told me that you know prabhupada practically never talked with them much about their particular spiritual affiliations but they were very appreciative of prabhupada and prabhupada engaged them and he told me that prabhupada once told me that this professor this uh, mishra yoga studio there is this yoga teacher mishra in new york yeah yeah and prabhupada stay initially so prabhupada said that philosophically we would argue like anything but culturally we were friends yeah so that is quite a significant thing so we we are not here denying the philosophical differences but we are not reducing a person to their philosophical position right so they are two different things yes and even our philosophy like when i speak to people of other faiths i like to quote uh, i don't quote it verbatim but anyabhi lashi tasunyam gana karma navita and explain how rupa goswami was such a genius that he separated a karma approach to religion a gana approach to religion and a bhakti approach to religion and then i explain a little you know karma is like you know asking oh lord won't you give me a house by the sea and let my child go to harvard you know or iit uh and then again and then what bhakti is and i find that is people they they light up it, it it's they and they they often see gosh our they say they say i had one person say yes ours is all mixed up we put that all together and i say yeah in india we call that a kitchen <laughs> uh, you know and, and i i and i try to glorify rupa goswami and it, and and let them in analyze their their uh, their faith in in light of rupa goswami's genius and we can also do that of course ourselves because that verse is definitely meant for devotees and do we allow karma and gan sometimes to cover anavritam our bhakti so to sorry how are you connecting that with our topic of so you are saying that i may approach from a karma perspective oh I no may... i was just making the point that uh when we we when we talked because you were talking about people who have all different deities on their altar and okay okay you know, yeah 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 okay. 
and and that 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 may be kind of sometimes a foot in the door to people of other faiths for them to think a little bit more clearly of where they're coming from. And I find that after I mention that to people of other religions, this is a little off our topic today, but they're much more interested in hearing about Krishna consciousness because it's such a brilliant analysis. Oh, okay. So, so what we are doing is we are providing them because so almost a non-sectarian tools for looking at their own tradition yeah. or looking at any tradition, in fact. Yeah. So, so when people see that we can offer them some wisdom, which doesn't threaten them, but which can illumine what they're doing, then naturally they become more open. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes I get to talk a little bit about Rupa Goswami and, yeah. you, know, you know, just what a person he was, you know, yeah. But it's a great analysis. I learned that from Ravindra Srupabhu, that he found that to be really oh. helpful. Yes. Yes, Prabhu. So, this, uh, so you, you, so I've, I talked about this philosophical categories, reducing people to philosophical categories. Yeah. So, this can happen both in our dealings with non devotees and it can happen in our dealings with devotees also. Absolutely. And I think that's where we come off as disagreeable. So, you know, we can disagree. So disagree, in my understanding, I w maybe you could elaborate on this phrase also, what it means to disagree without being disagreeable or disrespectful. So I thought what it means is that disagree is where the issue, we differ on that. But disagreeable means that we, we consider the other person self unworthy or defective yes. or condemnable for some reason. Exactly. I can give a good example from ISKCON's history. It goes back a little bit of ways, but uh, because it's far enough away, I think we can learn from it without, yeah. So in uh, 1986, and 80, 86 primarily, they, 85, 86, there was a lot of concerns about the guru issue in ISKCON. Yeah. Okay. And so senior devotees got together and they, they created what was called in those days the 50 man committee. Have you ever heard of that? No, 50 men. Oh, that's amazing. It was such a big thing in those days. So these were 50 other, just, yeah, I think they were all Prabhupada disciples. And they got, got together and said, look, we're going in the wrong direction. Uh, the way we're doing the guru issue and the fall downs and this and that, we got to put ISKCON straight. And Rivendra Supra, who was not a GBC at that time, was not a guru at the time, and, and he was kind of one of the leaders of that. Uh, I think Mukundu Maharaj may have also been quite involved in many others, many other wonderful Vaishnavas. And it really helped this con. I mean, you know, some people say it didn't go far enough, whatever, but it, it, it steered the ship in a, in a, I think what most people would say, uh, at least a somewhat better direction. But there were those who, uh, and most of those devotees did it in a way of appreciating the original 11 gurus, but you know, disagreeing with some of their practices, right? But there were some who were right about disagreeing, but twisted the knife and became offensive and critical and unreasonable and, you know, uh, like that. And this was before social media and the internet, by the way. <laughs> okay. And they uh, almost inevitably had some struggles in their Krishna consciousness afterwards. So, we can be we can be right and we can also be wrong we can be right and because of our presentation we can uh, uh we can become so like you know and you see this on the internet sometimes you know people are they're standing they're behind their computer and they say they write things that they would never necessarily say in front of a person or they they get involved with others and it's just a downward spiral that leads to vaishnava aparad and so we can disagree without being disagreeable and maintain Vaishnava. And, and the other thing is, it doesn't help anyone. It doesn't help the person who's being really, you know, angry, but it also doesn't change the other person's mind. Yeah. You know, if you're really trying to convince the other person, it just makes them stronger in their own resolve. Yes. And it's much better if you go up to them, my dear Prabhu, let's, we, let's, we could take Prasadam, okay, now Prasadam's up. I have this, this, can we talk about this? It really actually, and be very honest, it really disturbs my mind when I hear you quote this and this and this and come to this and this and this conclusion. We can be very 
honest about it. You know, more of an I message than a you message, if we're using modern communication parlance. You know, I really get disturbed. I really get upset. I, I don't see how ISKCON's future is going to be strong if we adopt just that idea. But I want to hear from you and hear your views on this uh, and have a discussion about this instead of just, you know, uh, attacking your character on the internet. And, oh. we have, and I think ISKCON's future is dependent on that kind of dialogue. It's interesting when you're saying we use I language that is not so much self-centered. It is more of say expressing vulnerability that yes. I am affected by this. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and Vaishnavas should be vulnerable to one another. But you know, just here's what an exercise doing a lot of my training. So we'd only take 20 seconds now. But if you have someone in your mind that you really trust, you know, just like you can tell them anything, you just trust them completely. Okay, so maybe you have one or two people in your mind like that. I'll give you two seconds to think of that. Yes. And all the listeners can be thinking of that. Now think of a person you really don't trust. You really just, you know, just don't trust them at all. You're afraid that anything you tell them will end up on Facebook in five minutes or whatever, right? And think of the differences of how you communicate with those two people. Right? Yeah, it's almost and, like... And where your heart is at with those two people. Where, you know, the lotus of your heart, how open is it or how close is it? So we need to... So trust is such an important part of, uh, of a society, of a creative society. Um, and we haven't even talked about, maybe on another podcast, we can talk about community and the importance of community development, but that's another thing. Mm -hmm. And so we want to, so that's, I think you would trust me. If I went up to you and say, Chaitanya Chan, uh, Chan, Chan Prabhu, I really think you're barking up the wrong tree on this part of our philosophy. I really disagree with you. I don't, I don't see how you didn't consider that Prabhupada said this is the fifth canto and this is the eighth canto. Um, I, I, and I feel very strongly, and when I hear your classes on it, I get an anxiety. Can we sit down and talk about that? I really like, I, 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 as strong as I feel, I think it's really important that I listen to your point of view and we have a discussion. How would you feel about me when I say that as opposed to, you know, I get on the internet and say, Chaitanya Chaitanya Charan Prabhu is so bogus. That guy hasn't even considered Prabhupada said this and Prabhupada said that. I mean, anyone who listens to him is just going to be contaminated. Now, how would you feel about me with those two different exchanges. It's almost as if, you know, if, if we could use a, like a physical posture, it's like, it's almost like a combative or defensive posture comes up in the mind in the second case. that you feel threatened and you want to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the first case, it's more like, yeah, I'm concerned. I don't want anyone to be disturbed by me, especially Vaishnava. So what can I do to help free you from your disturbance? Yeah. Now, you know, sometimes we, have, like I said, there's some bound, if someone's outside of the boundaries, you know, we may have to call a spade a spade or ISKCON may, you know, ban someone from visiting a temple or whatever, right? You know, if they're really, you know, that's, I'm, I'm going to make sure that we understand that's, you know, there may be some debate about where those boundaries are. Mm. That might be safe. But if you're, you're you said a, a, a physical uh, uh, visualization, so imagine we're sitting at a table and we're opposite each other and the, this is the issue and the issue is between us. And so we're having like a tug of war. Okay. Okay. But let's say you come around from the, from the other side and you're sitting next to me and we're both looking at the, you know, we're hand in hand and we're both looking at the, the issues and we're working together on the issue instead of the tug of war. That's a, maybe that visualization helps. A bit. That's beautiful. So it's not that we are fighting with each other over the issue, rather the issue is here and we are both partners in trying to deal with the issue. Yeah, I think that was the point of difference in debate and dialogue you read. It is not that I have the answer, but we, you also may have, we all have parts of the answer and let's come together to bring it all together. And Prabhupada emphasized, you know, I, 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 my understanding is that the main way Prabhupada managed this gun was through cooperation. 
we're a voluntary organization. No, you know, we're not getting paid. You know, what keeps us together is cooperation. And of course, you know, I think this is super uh, important in light of Bhakti Chumaraj's leading this world. He was so absorbed in that quote that your love for Prabhupada will be shown by how you cooperate to keep this institution together. So I think we should take that order on our head. And even if we feel strongly about this issue or that issue, feel that that's a, maybe even a bigger burden is the, mood, the burden of cooperation that Prabhupada has placed on us. Hmm. So, uh, so, so Swami, when Prabhupada, you said Prabhupada kept spread this movement through cooperation. I mean, I, my understanding is that you know, at that time, it was not so much cooperation that was required as submission to Prabhupada's authority. And that was quite easy. So, I mean, yes, Prabhupada emphasized cooperation, but I find it a little difficult to understand how, so that Prabhupada spread the movement through cooperation. Because well, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't say spread, I said managed. Um, huh. And so I did, I was once doing a word search on, on database for the word cooperation. And I only chose the word, the ones that were about management. So if it said cooperate with the Supreme Lord, I didn't include that. Okay. But it was all about, it was about management. And I also tried to be careful not to quote like a whole letter, but just the sentences about that. And I was up to 17 pages when I gave up. I was like two thirds, three, three quarters of the way through. And I was already up to 17 pages because yes. Okay. But Prabhupada was one person and the movement was in many, many countries. So he would often say, please cooperate with your GBC. Please cooperate with your temple president. Please some, find a way to cooperate with each other to push on this movement. It was on and on and on about that. And, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't like Prabhupada could have a podcast. You know, I, I was a bhakta when Prabhupada was still with us. And, you know, we would, be, we would relish when we would get a cassette tape of something. We'd play it again and again and again. Like, you know, of course, the stories about getting one of the next books and reading it. So, it, you know, he couldn't so easily... We didn't have the Prabhupada letters. We didn't have the Prabhupada conversations. You know, we didn't have everything that we have now. So, you know, he, he, he managed a lot through writing his letters. And his letters, so much was about cooperation. Yes. Please. That's what I meant. Yes, I agree with you. If I may just play the devil's advocate a little bit over here. No. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> That's a good one. So I was talking with one devotee about this and he, okay, I'm just repeating his point. So he said that most often cooperate is just a code word for submit to authority. See what I say. <laughs> <laughs> so yes. in, in a sense, uh, Prabhupada did, if whatever I have read, I can't say that I have read, I have read recently all the letters. So. And because you know, letters are such a thing that I think in context, if we read after five years, 10 years of experience, we see a lot of different things in that. But it seems that, uh, my, that whenever there was a conflict between, say, the temple president and some devotees, Prabhupada seems to defer to the opposite person in authority. Mm -hmm. And one understanding of mine was that it could be that you know, the person who is taking up the position of authority, they are also more committed, they are taking up responsibility. But in general, there is that, that some feeling of resentment that cooperation is simply a coded word for submission to authority. Any thoughts? Well, yeah, okay. Well, that, well, first of all, a few things. In an organization, you need, you need authority. And one of the big challenges ISKCON has had is that lo loss of respect for authority. You know, there was a time when GBCs, when they visited the temple, you'd wash their feet, you'd, you'd greet them, you know, they were treated, you know, uh, like that. And now it's just, sometimes it's like, hi Maharaj, hi Bull. <laughs> you know, you know it's, it's, it's it, uh, and for valid reasons, but I think one of the greatest ways that Kali enters this world is through, um, uh, a breakdown in faith in, in authority. You know, it, it wasn't long ago, Prabhu, when if I wanted to publish a book, 
I, I had to have so many credentials and I had to prove to the publisher that I was a, a, an enough of an authority that they would publish the book. Now, anyone can put anything on a website, can self-publish, can you know, say any damn thing, and it's in a book or, or a website or a magazine, or, right? Anyone can do anything. It wasn't always like that, you know? And, and, and that's a little off the subject, but um, Yeah, but let me put it this way, if I may put it, you know, this is not necessarily a bad thing, democratization of, democratization of, say, the means of expression, because sometimes, say, for example, currently the, the unrest, racial unrest that is there in America, it started because, you know, people had smartphones, if they had waited for the mainstream media, for the police to file a report and it come to media, it might never have come also. So in some ways, grievances can be aired more easily when, when they don't have to necessarily uh, go through channels of authority. Well, that's, oh my God, you know, that's a big topic. And, and I know it's a little different than your original question. Um, okay. But if we want to go there, yes, there are some things that, by the way, there's some things that should not be worked out by mediation, by win-win. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's it's not a one size fits all. There are times when, for example, you want to set a precedent, right? Like for example, Iskhan has done that with uh, with Rific philosophy, and um, with uh, um, well, with with overemphasis on on. Um, Rasika uh, topics, things mm -hmm. like that. And by the way, I'm not here to poo-poo either of those. I'm part of a team that's working on relationships with uh, with the main, uh, you know, we could call Ritvik or uh, uh, officiating Acharya, you mm -hmm. know, uh, uh, team. And 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 there's good conversations going on. So I'm not, I don't I don't want someone to send this uh, uh, recording to them and they oh run to be you know no there's some good but but the point is. But the point is like, oh, here, here's an example. We're talking about civil rights. I don't know if you ever heard of Rosa Parks. Yeah, Rosa Parks. She was a, she was a black bodied a woman in 1950s who You're refused to sit in the back of the bus. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, if she would have just worked out a mediation, you know, so the bus driver said, well, could you at least sit in the middle of the bus? And she said, okay, I don't want to cause it. That, would have, that could have set back the civil rights movement by some years. Yeah. So it was good that it actually went to court and it was decided not by mediation, but by a judge and, you know, something like that. Right. So, so some things maybe in black life matters, maybe, maybe another situation like that when social media or, or, or fighting it has, would produce more of a result than just, well, let's sit down with a few people and, you know, maybe I'm not. Okay. Um, so there are things like that when you want to kind of, uh, establish a precedent or, or send out a message, you know, there we're, you know, 95, 98% of the decisions in ISKCON should be what we call power base. Uh, an, an authority makes a decision, really? um, but I there are times like there, but you know, when there's conflict, sometimes it's good to sit down and work it out, you know? So I just want to make that, so make that clear, but I think, just a minute. I think we can say that, in the balance, social media and and the internet have caused a lot of anxiety in yes, the world of and this kind. I mean, Prabhupada didn't even. I don't know what Prabhupada would say about about email because he didn't want us to use a telex machine because he said that it would just we would just talk for Jalpa. I just don't know. I can't predicate his mind, you know, because it's so. It's the these are the ways to communicate and preach also. Um, but it was so interesting. The telex, which was, you know, like one hundredth of what email can do. And he said, they'll, they'll just talk for Jalpa. Okay. So, so, just going back to the point, 95% you feel that should be resolved by a power, stru power structure? Well, by pow power, you know, is, has a negative connotation these days. But in, in conflict management, there's three things. Power based, meaning just you have a position, you make a decision. It might be the nicest decision in the world, 
It might be, my dear brahmacharis, why don't you go and spend two weeks in Vrindavan and here in Chan? Okay? Okay. So, you know, or just, you know, who's going to do the four o'clock uh, offering? You know, uh, so-and-so is sick. Uh, could you please do it? You know, that's what I mean. It's not oh. all like... Oh. Okay. And then there's right space. Right space means uh, a neutral third person decides, like a judge or, or a group but to decide something, okay? okay. You, you make your argument, they, uh, you make your argument, I make my argument, and the, these three devotees decide. That's called right space. And then interest space is what we're talking about in this kind of result. We try to sit down and we try to understand the needs, interests, and concerns of everyone and see if there's a win-win mm -hmm. way to address all of those, the, everyone's concerns in a way that, and sometimes you come up with a real creative way and like, like for example, uh, what I did as a Sangratan leader, you know, mm. high, you know, we all go to India to do this. But we can come up with a third way, a creative way of working things out. And also, I'll say one other, and also help devotees save face. Saving face is important. And I find, you know, I lived in India for 21 years. It's very important in India to just people in general and also for our devotees. So to just splash something on the internet or something, but if we can work something out in a way that's done at a lower level, as lower level as possible, and and we and everyone gets to kind of you know feel that they 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 won something out of it, and and they can go on with their Krishna consciousness without being embarrassed in public. It's so much better for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, after all, we have to live in the same community for our, for our lifetime. So if yeah. somebody loses face, then then it's a big problem. One sannyasi, I remember doing a mediation once, and the sannyasi said, he said, I'm a sannyasi. I don't have anything. The only thing I have is my reputation. Please don't take that away from me. So it's, a, it's, it's big for some people. Yeah. yeah. And actually, especially for a, somebody like a sannyasi, the, the credibility of the preaching will depend on the reputation. It can't do any service at all. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, true. So this is, a, this is an excellent analysis, I think. I, that there are to be, I think, a lot of practical decisions. There has to be a power, power based. And otherwise, we'll just have endless discussions and nothing will move forward. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So now. Just maybe a couple of questions and then I won't take too much of your time. I have another 20 minutes and I have to. Yes, sir, yes. Yeah, so if, uh, say when there are differences between devotees and then those devotees try to resolve it from whatever way and somehow that doesn't get resolved. And there could be, in a sense, different ways of practicing bhakti. So, it could be that you know you do it your way and I will do it my way. So now in some ways you talk about open-mindedness. Is it more a characteristic of say liberals and less of conservatives? Because liberals by nature are I used to think like that, but sometimes I have seen that the liberals are also quite illiberal toward the conservatives. Totally. <laughs> totally. <laughs> yes. So open-mindedness is not necessarily the, everybody needs to be open-minded and it's not a prerogative of one, one, one way of thinking. Right. Uh, open-mindedness is, uh, is one way to put it. I would try to put it in more of a Vaishnava way of uh, appreciation of other Vaishnavas and their realizations. Again, as long as they're within the boundaries. Hmm. Right, and so an actual appreciation for Vaishnavas who have a, a different view. Also, they're preaching to different people. You know, if you're if you're preaching to a New Yorker, it's like totally different than if you're preaching in Aligarh you know, or wherever. You, you know what I mean? It's yeah. a, it's a totally different universe, and so you may take a very different approach. Yes, bro. And and Prabhupada, you know, look how liberal Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasana, you know, you can serve the meat if you have to. Or I don't remember the details, you probably remember better than me, but he had like some kind of mundane carnival 
going on yes. right next. Yeah, you know, so, you know, or, or, or Prabhupada telling the devotees in, in Iran they can teach through yoga, you know, Hatha Yoga, Ashtanga Yoga, and, and, and they get grateful concerts with the Grateful Dead, you know, and everyone's stoned out of their head. You know, that was early in the movement, but still, you know, yes. and he also had his, his other, you know, side, uh, I, I mean, other emphasis. Uh, you can't say Prabhupada had a side or not. He, he was trans... It's very hard to pigeonhole Prabhupada. We have to be careful not to do that because he was this transcendental person who, who as uh, in the most adept way possible can adjust time, place, and circumstance. You know, and, you, know you have these great jugglers who can do things without seamlessly. Prabhupada could adjust time, place, and circumstance so expertly. Hmm. Yes. So expertly. So it's in a sense, we can say Prabhupada has used many different approaches, and it is our responsibility to find out which approach works in getting people to come closer to Krishna. Yeah. Rather than thinking that, so it's more of you could say faithfulness to the purpose of Srila Prabhupada rather than the specifics of what he did, because what he did was so yes. many different things at different times. Yes. yes. And, and you can do it sometimes. I won't, again, I won't mention names, um, but we once, I once had a dialogue with, if you could just imagine the most, what we would label conservative person in our movement and the most liberal person. Mm. And it was such a respectful dialogue. Now, I don't know what they say about each other now, but that's not the point. In that dialogue, I remember we were going, walking to go take Prasadam and the, very conservative person said to the very, you know, we are, we have the same goal. We're just approaching it from different directions. You know, and for me, I was like, wow. Or one time, and I think I can mention this one by name. Well, no, I won't mention it by name. Uh, but, you know, uh, <clears throat> I was involved in, uh, in the Vrindavan Guru Kula. And we had, Anyway, to make a very long story short, we, we made the Guru Kula up to a certain age, and we tried to follow Prabhupada's standards for that. And then after that, we called it an international school because we used the ICSU the curriculum, ICSC curriculum, and, and for various reasons, I think of a hundred reasons, and I'm sure anyone who hears this might say, bogus, bogus, but, that's, but there were reasons, okay. Uh, and then you have the, uh, Ma the Mayapur Guru Kula, mm. right? And, you know, with the, with the, the wooden shoes and the, the unsewn cloth and learning the Vedic traditions. And the leader of that school once came up to me, and it was such a poignant statement. He said, he said so you're, at least with the older boys, you're dovetailing uh, that curriculum in Krishna consciousness. We're dovetailing the Vedic in Krishna consciousness. That's so... So he didn't, say, he didn't say the standard thing that no Vedic is Krishna. He said, we're dovetailing that in Krishna consciousness. You're dovetailing this in Krishna consciousness. And I, I had so much appreciation for that statement. Um, and, and, and that liberal, well, well, liberal, that's the view, use the word broad-minded or that appreciative yeah. way of, uh, of saying things. Uh, so yeah. those, two, those two instances are kind of in my brain very much as something to be sought after. Yes, true. true. This is beautiful. Just taking this example forward to one last question now. That imagine if those both two people had to work in the same school. Now, that would have been very difficult for them. Correct. So both of them had their space and they could appreciate what the other person was doing. Yes. So I believe that there is some proposal that we can have orders in our movement so that the, is that something in the pipeline or is it just very vague discussion? There's discussion and it's just hard to figure out how to do it. Um, one thing in the, because the orders comes from the Catholic Church and, and Jai Patakamara says that Prabhupada told him you can study the Catholic Church to get some ideas about management. Mm -hmm. And he also said, uh, the, was it the Ram Krishna Mission, I believe he said. Um, so one thing is that they're, all the orders are faithful to the Pope. Yes. Right. Uh, so some orders uh, in this may, 
uh, you know, they, they will have to see if they'd be willing to do that. Um, so who would be like the Pope here, GBC? So the GBC body, yeah. And I, I, how would we implement it? Would it be temple-wise or guru-wise or individual ethos-wise or what? <laughs> it, that's one of that's why we haven't uh, we don't have it yet because it, you know the implementation is a challenge. Now, one thing that we did um, uh, pass in the GBC years ago, and I I think I actually helped to write the resolution, and that was that there can be more than one center in a temple, and they can cooperate, but they can have different emphasis. As long as they don't step on each other's toes, like the, the classical thing would be, uh, you know, some uh, approaching the other temple, the new temples approaching the old temples donors. That mm -hmm. would obviously cause, you know, people or trying to steal brahmacharis or, you know, oh, we're, we're a much purer practice of Christian consciousness here. But there can be different moves. And cities are big places. You know, how many, how many people are in, uh, in, uh, Mumbai or New York. I mean, uh, you know, New York now, yeah, 12 million. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there can be, you know, and what do we have? We have maybe five centers in Mumbai. Yeah. I'm sure we could have a hundred. It's so big, right? <laughs> you know, uh, I, I don't mean to use Mumbai or India as an example, but that yeah. was, that was the idea behind it, that this could accelerate the spreading of Krishna consciousness. Cause some, cause some people are going to be more attracted to this kind of preaching and some of them like, uh, like uh, I've heard from Giri Raj Swami that he, Prabhupada, suggested for downtown Mumbai that there be a center, no deities, right? There'd be chairs and not, not sitting on the floor and lecture, different attractive lectures and things like that. And so some people would be, some people would be attracted to that and others would be attracted to the de beautiful deity worship in Juhu or, you know, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so we can, we can have, if there's, if there's cooperation and if there's appreciation and dialogue, yes. then we could, uh, we could do that. So just to, I mean, conclude this point that, so cooperation also requires, first of all, operation. You know, if somebody feels I'm being so choked that I can't survive, then they need some space. And once there is space, then they, they can mutual appreciation. So what yeah. you're trying to say is that we are, we are at the world is so big that we can create spaces like that for individual expression. Yeah, and, and for attracting different kinds of people. Yes, that's true. Now maybe a temple can be really great and have different programs. That's fine, you know. Um, but somehow or other, there's different folks. There's different. What is it? Different slopes for different folks. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, and some will be attracted to the beautiful deity worship. Some will be just attracted to, I mean, at least in the West, in the old days, it was a prashadam that won us, most of us over. <laughs> Some the philosophy. Some will be the friendship. You know, just having, you know, people who have some values in life. What a relief. You know, and we gradually bring them all to the, probably at least the basics of Prabhupada's standards, 16 rounds, four regular principles, et cetera, et cetera. But there's different classes of people. And uh, look at Prushota Maharaj preaching to the uh, tribals. Yes. Right? And, and he's going to speak to people differently than, uh, you know, than you are at a university. Completely different, yeah. But it's the same goal. Hmm. Yes, true. So... This is a beautiful note to end on. So maybe I'll just... Well, like, well, let me end it with a real beautiful note. Prabhupada gave the example of a, a vase. With, he said a, a, a vase is very beautiful when there's a variety of flowers. Yes. So the variety of flowers are different devotees with different moods. And uh, the vase is like our, our movement. Our movement, yes. And uh, our love for Prabhupada. Uh, and are wanting to please the Guru Parampara and Krishna. Yes. Again, within the boundaries of Siddhanta. So Prabhu, I'll just try to summarize what we discussed and maybe you could, uh, so, you know, we discussed about this topic of how to disagree without being disagreeable. You started with your journey of how you started exploring uh, conflict resolution and then you created structures across eventually structures were created across the world now and devotees can access in various ways about uh, so they can go to the website and access and then 
we discussed about look i think the question do devotees have more conflicts or less than others so there are some common factors which is information then uh, relationships then structures and values but beyond that it is our own identity our investment in our identity that can cause conflicts especially think, in in, in faith based organizations, in organizations like ours yeah and i think that and values was the main part of our remaining discussion so it is amazing you quoted prabhupad saying we should appreciate even people who are not devotees and what to speak of devotees and that appreciation or that broad mindedness it can come if we learn to see others as devotees not just see them reduce them to the position that is problematic for us and then you also talk about i based speech, i centered speech or what is i based i messages i messages okay so which yeah. is more of expressing vulnerability rather than expressing judgment about the other person and uh, if we focus on the fact that we all have the same ultimate purpose then we can we can minimize differences sometimes because we emphasize philosophy so we reduce people to philosophical categories right. rather than seeing them as multifaceted beings and prabhupad has given many examples of he being philosophical they having differences but being uh, culturally friendly so and then you also made this point that the three ways power based uh rights rights based and interest based resolutions and most may be power based so when a call for cooperation seems to be like a a deference to authority that's not necessarily a bad thing if it is operational but and we talked also a little bit about social media and how it can uh, can unnecessarily spread spread negative vibrations but there are means by which devotees can express their grievances and have things addressed and toward the end we talked about that there is we have created space for devotees by provisions like different devotees can have different uh, outreach centers within same city so that means we appreciate each other but we try to have space for ourselves and that way we can have unity and diversity like a like a set of flowers in a flower vase so this was very illuminating discussion prabhu any concluding words you want to say no you uh but just what you just did summarizing is one of the best ways to have a good rapport with other devotees because it shows that you were respectful enough to listen and when you summarize like that it's also if you're having a dialogue or you know debate uh it's great to summarize the other person's points before you make your own because the person will feel much more, oh yes he's understood me okay so it's very good for relationships and also for clear clear thinking so thank oh. you so much for doing that you did so wonderfully thank you very much prabhu wonderful to have you here thank, thank you thank you for having me prabhu hari krishna glorious prabhu jai prabhu